let's see, I'm just going to start off by saying that um, choosing technologies is the point of writing the book. Uh, our entire chapter 12 is dedicated to the processes of uh, how do you match these complex business requirements with this now incredibly complicated solution space. Um, so it's a very important process. Uh, we've tried to borrow a lot of the techniques from Carnegie Mellon to pull it in um, and do that architectural trade-off analysis. Uh, there's no, never going to be a perfect match uh, and trying to understand those trade-offs and getting your customers to rank their priorities is a really hard process. Um, so I, I uh, encourage people to uh, think about it very carefully. Um, and I think the thing that I've learned now is that uh, it's getting more complicated. Uh, we have new vendors with new approaches. We have new vendors that are entirely, entirely rewritten their stack uh, all around solid state drives. And they're saying that that's the only way they're going to get the performance uh, by, by rewriting things for solid state drives. So I think things have gotten more complicated. Um, I think it's a very challenging question about choosing technology. And um, I'm going to just turn it over to some other people and, and have them introduce themselves and uh, tell us what you learned and what you liked and, and what do you think about the process of selecting the right database. Uh, Karen, you want to go next? Next. Next. First. <laughs> So I always enjoy coming to this conference because as a data architect, I'm really doing not only SQL. So SQL and no SQL stuff, which sounds very circular the way it I does. just said that. <laughs> um, so you know, my sort of mantra that I looked for in all the presentations was that I believe that every good design decision, every good architecture decision comes down to cost, benefit, and risk. And we can't just talk about what's the right solution for everybody. And, and I think that discussion has kind of waned a bit, thank goodness. That's also part of, of, of a hype cycle, is that there's a right or wrong instead of this is just part of our toolkit. And that I did see in a lot more presentations this concept of it's not only SQL and that there are certain use cases where these things work and certain use cases where other things work better and that we all have to fit within our own sort of cultures and expertise and everything. And that's the type of discussion I want to see going forward. I uh, definitely agree with, with all that. Um, do. <laughs> yes, sorry, I, I would love to disagree to just to make it exciting, but what can, what can I say? Uh, one thing that I found interesting, I don't know if, uh, how many people here saw the lightning talk, but uh, we now uh, can do teleportation. Uh, and I think that's, that's amazing. I, I'm not quite sure what it has to do with NoSQL, but uh, uh, definitely uh, think that that's a great uh, um, new thing coming along. Uh, also really like that we had a couple of uh, people speak about anti-fragility. Uh, and it's really important when you're designing, you know, the, the reason that NoSQL has become so popular is that we're running against all kind of limits. And uh, it's really good as developers to think about uh, prepare for the fact that you're going to have failure. Prepare for the fact that things are going to go down, uh, and just be be ahead of the curve and uh, and plan for it. And um, I I think that that's a really important uh, aspect of uh, of where we're going. Great. So um, in my role, um, I'm running a company that is doing development, consulting, and training. We get exposed to companies who are trying to identify technologies and identify the best way to adopt them. So um, in, in my experience, uh, I have found that one of the key three questions that you need to ask are what are the things that matter to you when it comes to data? Is it performance? Is it different data formats? Is it large amounts of data? And then when you identify these questions, you can uh, prioritize them. It is very difficult to prioritize them. So that's why you should prioritize, but don't agonize. You don't want to make a, a three-month project just making a decision about priorities. And the key thing is when you are trying to answer these questions, I encourage you to try out things. You should never trust the benchmarks of vendors. You will find some really surprising results. When, when you look at one vendor which, uh, for example, uh, promotes excellent performance, and there is another one which has much lower performance. When you create a benchmark that is going through your use cases with your data formats, with your volumes, you may actually find very surprising results. So, uh, somebody who appears like underdog in, in publicly available benchmarks may show up as, as, a, as a winner in, in your specific benchmark. So always try it out yourself. Try, to, uh, try it out not only on, on one developer's laptop, but try to organize clusters that would 
uh, handle data which are very close to, to what you have in production. And if needed, you can move to, the, to some of the clouds, set up the infrastructure there, and, and run some more realistic benchmark. I think this is one of the key things that uh, you need to do. Uh, the fourth thing is really related to changing the mindset. Uh, when you look into traditional data organizations, you will see that the mindset is traditional and relational, and it was like that for the last 15 years. Now, if you present just uh, exciting technical advantages of some of the NoSQL technologies, they may not buy into it, you know. And, and usually with a significant change in technology, there is always significant change in power within the organization. So traditional data outfits may be actually quite resilient to abandon this power and relinquish it to somebody, some newcomers. So this is why education is critically important, training uh, data departments to learn to perceive things in a different way. To see things in a non-relational way is actually one of the key challenges. And it is a process. You need to educate everybody from the individual architects all the way to the uh, CTO of the company. What are the challenges and benefits? And they should not expect miracles. There are no silver bullets, but you will end up with a plenty of aluminum bullets with all different NoSQL systems. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, th I think that's exactly what it's about. It's all those different NoSQL systems. So it's about the idea that one size does not fit all, which is the key, um, the key take home, really, I would say, from the whole NoSQL movement. Um, I guess if there's a trough of disillusionment to go back to uh, the, the, the question, um, then it's probably around the name NoSQL as much as anything. Uh, I think it's a really unhelpful name, and I'm, I'm probably allowed to say that because the guy who came up with it was actually on the Akunu team for a couple of years, and every time you reminded him, uh, that it's like, hey, look, you know, uh, everybody's calling a NoSQL, and that was a phrase that you came up with. He used to hold his head in his hands <laughs> and say, yeah, I didn't mean it that way. And it's not... <laughs> Um, so it's not, really, it's not really about not having SQL. It's, it's, it's an aspirational uh, title that perhaps is really more about scalability, availability, and performance. And for data models as well, to your point, uh, that aren't necessarily the right shape for fitting into a traditional relational pattern. And uh, it's aspirational because those things are fundamentally hard to achieve. Yeah, we are dealing with data sets which have increased in volume and in variety and in velocity. But fundamentally, it's about value. You know, to, to go back to Karen's uh, point, you know, you've, got to, you've got to think about the economic cost point that the data, processing the data to any particular data set justifies. You know, taking on work is risk, but really it's about the economic, it's about the economic cost point. And there doesn't need to be one overall solution that works for all of the data that, that you have in your enterprise. I think, I think those days are gone. And I think um, the NoSQL movement as a whole has really embraced that. And uh, the, education, the education around that is, is, is really spreading. I just wanted to respond to Vladimir's kind of, uh, comment about the benchmarking. Um, uh, one of the lessons I've learned is that um, benchmarks usually don't test the type of load that you're going to have in your collection set, and especially when you see companies that are only testing read and write performance. And the biggest thing to remember about that is the caching, is that most real-world applications are running the same queries over and over again. And so those queries are going to start to run much, much faster the more you put things in cache. And so one of the lessons I've learned is that uh, you shouldn't actually be using anybody's benchmarks but your own, and you should spend a huge amount of time understanding the load that you think you're going to have, although that's really hard, and building, uh, using, there's tools like JMeter that are very, very good at helping you set up and simulate loads, but then realizing that you're going to have to simulate the repetition to see if those caches are really going to be set up and working and whether these systems use that. So never trust a vendor's benchmark. Uh, mm -hmm. Trust their knowledge. I mean, one of the things I try to see is if, if, if somebody says they're really good with solid state drives, Make sure you can go to their website and find out how they really utilize solid state drives, but ignore their benchmarks. And that's one of the lessons I think I, I'd As like Nathan Mars said, we have to look at this as, as any other engineering, and you've you got to measure everything. And you, know, you, you need a baseline, and you need to know how things are changing and, and measure whatever you're doing. Yeah, mm. absolutely. And maybe on the, point of, uh, on the point of benchmarks as well. Remember, your system's going to change as well. If you're building a project and you've benchmarked it really carefully and you've sized it really carefully and then it's really successful, 
Uh, the number of users you're going to need to deal with is going to change. Maybe the, the hardware you use over time is going to change. Uh, the hardware that Amazon installs or who are, whichever other cloud provider you're using is going to change. So this is not just about looking at all the, the, the parameters, but it's about measuring what happens if you change a particular configuration of things. You know, what if people start storing data which is potentially larger than you'd anticipated? What if you started using servers which have solid state? or even MLC rather than SLC solid state drives. So you know, you, you're sort of not just looking for a single number, but sensitivity to a bunch of parameters in terms of, um, in terms of results there. And you know, no performance measurement is worth anything, of course, if it's not for your workload, as you say, but also if you don't know the dollar figure next to it. Yeah, good one. OK, are you guys ready? Uh, does anybody have any questions that you'd like to have for the group here? I have one, one question I'm going to start out with to warm the group up is, uh, we've talked about choosing technologies. Uh, and I know that right now there's a lot of people that are in colleges and universities and they're taking classes on databases. <coughs> and uh, I suspect only a small percentage of classes today are actually even talking about NoSQL architectures. So that is the students that are graduating today are still learning the dominant relational models as the primary and maybe they're talking about analytical, and, and that's about it. So uh, does anybody have any thoughts about what we can do to get a broader uh, set of uh, decision-making skills uh, into the curriculum at the college and university level? I have something for that. Because, so I actually accredit college and university programs all over the world uh, in the computing field. Um, and I have to tell you, they're not learning relational databases either in a lot of programs. <laughs> if they are, they're getting one assignment that uses a relational database, and quite often that's Microsoft Access at the undergraduate level, or something open source that their literal assignment was the equivalent of a Hello World problem in databases. So just to let you know, because I get to look at student work, not just the description of the courses, but student work. So all is not lost for NoSQL because <laughs> it's not for databases in general. Having said that, um, there so we're are keeping some, pace. We're keeping pace. We're keeping pace. Up, right? Good. But the way that you influence academic programs of study, especially at the undergraduate level, is by participating in college advisory boards or teaching in them as well. Right. So taking that several zeros off your paycheck and teaching <laughs> post-secondary education. Um, and the other thing is, is to help instructors, uh, for the vast majority of people, it's not computer science that people are studying. It's information systems or private uh, post-secondary training uh, uh, organizations. Is to help them develop materials and labs and all of that stuff and providing support to them. Because the instructors aren't paid well, they don't have enough time for them to go learn all of the new technologies and also develop all the courseware. So that's often what I hear from academics, is that's how you get people to understand those basics. And so like o open source uh, textbooks and that kind of thing? Open source yeah. textbooks and labs. It, like, it's not just resource material. It's helping them get those technologies into the classroom in a way where people have no background in data theory. It would be cool to get them to use GitHub and then put some open source. They do source. all that, yeah. They do uh, all that. Okay. Yeah. That's good. So having spent some, some uh, years in academia, I must say I'm a little bit skeptical about uh, being successful with wide NoSQL education. I think what we are going to see is something very similar to what we have seen with object-oriented technologies when they start emerging. We will see a couple of top universities with their research programs. Uh, they are going to train a small number of students. Uh, majority of universities were not picking on object-oriented technologies until they become mainstream, until we had a C++ as being very dominant language and then Java started emerging. Um, is that going to happen with NoSQL? We see that there is a variety of different technologies, a variety of different players. It may be difficult for uh, an instructor at college uh, to pick uh, on these technologies, make uh, sound decisions, create some curriculum, knowing also that things may change and next year uh, the, the things that uh, they are teaching may not be so current or even valid. So I think uh, the most of the education is actually not going to happen in colleges for foreseeable future and I think uh, the most of the education is going to happen uh, through uh, young developers 
uh, getting into companies who are trying to experiment with some non-SQL technologies. They will be reading tutorials. You will have all kinds of informal learning, group learning, uh, attending some uh, webinars and, and short uh, information segments that they would uh, get from, from a website. So I don't think that we will see organized training. In companies, yes. When the company uh, decides to go with some technology, then uh, we create a curriculum and uh, then there is a particular rollout with technology adapted to the field in which the company is planning to apply this. Uh, well, I, I'd like to ask you a question on this, which is, uh, are we even mature enough to that point where we should even be thinking about this? Are we maybe, do we maybe need to wait a little bit longer for, for things to mature and, um, and, uh, and to, you know, because we're still like feeling it out. It's kind of bleeding edge. Well, I, 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 um, I think a lot of the core database patterns, I think we're, we're going to see key value stores in a database selection pattern for the next 20 years. I don't think that's going to yeah. really change. I think graph databases are certainly not going to go away because they solve things uniquely. Um, I don't think analytical things are going to go away either. And I think relational. But it's not about going away. It's just about, you know, if we've really gotten the science down. That, that's, a good, that's a good point. I think a lot of the techniques that we see, um, concepts of sharding and replication, aren't going to go away. And I think those should be taught. I think distributed computing is very new, but I think the techniques in distributed computing are, are relatively stable. So I, I'd say there's probably a 60-40. That 60% 60 of the things in our book are going to be pretty stable over the next 20 years, and maybe 40 of it, 40 of it will change. But I still think it's worthwhile to try to introduce it. One of the questions I'd like to ask is, does anybody have suggestions on how we can get some of the ideas that have come across this conference out to the more general public? And maybe it's maybe college and university is too narrow. Maybe it's even within local meetups or things like that. Uh, suggestions? I see a hand. Uh, Eric, do you have a comment? Um, so I work at a university. I'm not faculty. <laughs> I'm one of you. <laughs> but if you want college kids to know some of this technology, internships. Go to internships, your okay. And offer internships. You don't have to pay them much. You can if you want, but you know what? They're all so I would agree with, with, with that and, um, you know, when I was a graduate student, we were teaching uh, NoSQL essentially and distributed systems topics to undergraduates and it was pretty well covered actually. Uh, and this, this was, mind you, this was at Cambridge where actually uh, they insisted on teaching ML as an introductory programming language, <laughs> even though the inventor of C++, and no C++ on the curriculum at all, even though the inventor of C++ was a graduate of the uh, department. So, you know, you can't reason with these things. But, I mean, there are certainly many interesting hands-on, I, I take the point the hands-on side is very, is very important, um, very many interesting hands-on training sessions that you see done in workshops uh, at conferences and meetups um, that, that we've been involved in as a, a community's been involved in as a company. Um, and an interesting area, I think, around distributed systems, because a lot of it does, as you, as you mentioned, come from the academic literature, where there's a strong overlap between what researchers were looking at 20 years ago and what is being used now. 
uh, there are been some interesting projects to sort of try and uh, spread the knowledge around that. So you're know, just thinking about the NoSQL Summers project, which was set up by Tim Onglard um, and ran in, I think, about 20 countries around the world, which was sort of informal do-it-yourself reading groups looking at academic papers. Um, and there, were, there were groups that we, we were involved in in the Bay Area and in London. Um, and in fact, we did actually offer internships to, the, to, to Eric's point, I think, um, out of just people that we met who were clearly very uh, capable and interested in learning those technologies out of those reading groups that we did. And um, yeah, I think there is a lot of education going on in this space. The problem is, <laughs> the problems that we're trying to solve here are, are hard you know, computer science problems. Book or T-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, how about up, up here we have a comment? Go ahead, Jen. Well, um, oh, this gentleman has the microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. So I'm sorry. For the sake of that. No, I, would, I won't take much time and let you talk. Um, two, two things which came to mind in, during the discussion. Uh, one of the other uh, summit I attended for Cassandra, I think sponsored by Datastax, they had a scholarship program in colleges, and I saw um, a competition where they showed the graduate students or Kansas area, so I'm a data coach and pioneer in the in the Midwest, and uh, to a lot of companies there, and it's been a wonderful week, a lot of good learning. But I have some questions, kind of going back to Karen's lightning talk, that uh, hopefully people will, uh, you know, I've heard about scalability, performance, database patterns, but I haven't really heard a lot about anybody really wanting to understand the data they're pulling in, or what about data accuracy, data quality. So I was wondering, what kind of steps or tools are you guys using, and what's what are you, what are you doing in that area, or is that out on the horizon? Or are you just worried about, let's just serve it really fast? So I, I, oh, and by the way, I plan on taking this information back to the Kansas City DEMA, because I'm usually oh, the one great, that's pushing great. things back. So okay. if there's anybody in here that wants to go to DEMA chapters and talk, usually they, they're very open to speakers. So I, I think, uh, for my perspective, one of the things uh, about specifically document stores is uh, you can load up a lot of data very, very quickly that you can query. And so one of the first things you can do about data quality is you can do statistical uh, analysis of large data sets. And specifically, you can look at counts of elements and then exceptions. Uh, and, and, and if you see a few records that have a few elements that don't occur in a lot of others, you know those may be outliers. And that's just a beginning of how you might uh, approach data quality. I think one of the things uh, that I've learned is that data quality uh, can happen after data is loaded, and it doesn't have to happen before. Uh, and so we use much more statistical. You can use frequency counts of letters in last names as a good example to see uh, uh, what those data quality things are. And if you start to see L's and zeros in last names, you know that data entry fields didn't check for uh, characters. So I think it's uh, statistics is a really big, powerful tool. And we would call that data profiling. Data Coming profiling. From that side. So if you're researching about that, that's what we would. And we have tools to do that. Data Definitely profile. in the SQL world but also pointing against spreadsheets and XML files and all that stuff too. Right, but how, how's that gonna work in with, I mean, we're talking a lot about streaming and real-time 
processing. We're not going to be. That's a different <laughs> use case. So not all use cases are streaming and pro. You know, so a document, especially a document thing, isn't as much focused on fast streaming sensor data, right? Yeah, absolutely. If I understand that right. And I'd like to follow up a little bit. The, the steps that they're doing in data profiling and the tools today are something that everybody in the room needs to understand. You can go out there and Google it, and there are algorithms that tell you how to look at your data and understand the quality before you load. So you don't necessarily have to buy the tools. If you understand the techniques, that may help you also, and but, I think it's important. But we can also do it after the load. Like, that's you the whole thing. You can do it after, but data During. profiling has steps and algorithms that will help you. Yeah. I would like to add to that. Uh, I have right now a client for whom we are building a data quality system. And they are getting data that is uh, that often has uh, ridiculous uh, values, <laughs> and uh, some uh, some of the text in these uh, values have typos. And uh, uh, so what what we are doing currently, we are planning to uh, store this data into a columnar database, and then we have a set of agents that are running various rules. So uh, some of these agents are using statistical information that during uh, matching with the databases of known entities and we are trying to correct the typos. Uh, for those subsets that cannot be machine resolved, we are uh, streaming this data to data stewards. Data steward is a role where you have a human who is trying to figure out what is wrong with this data. And for this particular client, uh, for example, the, the name of the company, 3M, is uh, spelled in over 600 different ways in, in the last 10 years. Or 600 different ways, which is fascinating. So what is interesting from the NoSQL approach, um, I have mentioned columnar database. So um, as we ingest the data, we put the data in these columns. And then whenever some of the agents apply the rules, we are going to create the um, enhanced record with a timestamp. And we also have the audit log. So if you look at a the, at the particular record, you will have the, uh, the history of this data. Who changed it? Was it the automatic agent? Was it uh, a person? And uh, then you have a full traceability of your audit log. Now, uh, when you're doing the queries, you will be getting the data with the latest timestamp, which is the best data that you currently know. And uh, if you need to reason quickly, that may be the best that you can get. If you have data steward who is going to be a person who looks into that, next day you may have the improved value. So your, your data quality is actually going to increase over time. So okay. could, we, um, Sorry, could we move on to the next one or yeah. else? We'll, yeah, we won't uh, get through enough questions. One here and then we'll take your question. Uh, my question is about the original topic of this uh, discussion about choosing the technology. So, so far in the conference, I've you know, learned that, OK, I can make the first classification of, do I want a graph? Do I want a key value store? Uh, do I want columnar or a big table? So say, for example, OK, I understood based on my business problems that I need to have a key value store. Now, within the key value store, now I have, before coming to the conference, I had one choice. Now, after the conference, I have five choices. <laughs> and out of them, four are fairly new, which I never heard of before coming to the conference. Now, last three or four months, I've invested in one technology, learning it, and building a proof of concept, which I can show to my you know, uh, senior you know, managers who can take a decision on it. Now, I would be questioned, being a developer, that, OK, have you thought about the new technology which has come? Now, how many prototypes I keep on doing before I actually reach a decision or you know, probably spend next few years keep Depends, doing are prototypes. Are you an employee or, or a consultant? consultant. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Used to be a consultant, now an employee, so probably I made a bad decision okay. already. You don't want to so. do too many then. <laughs> Anybody want to take that one? That's the paradox of choice, right? The paradox of choice, yes. When you go so to the grocery you store. You remember the... when I mentioned uh, prioritize, but don't agonize. <laughs> you see? So at one point, you need to decide. Sometimes just flipping a coin is the right decision to make. And uh, when you find a system that seems to be right, go for it. Do a prototype. And you may refine later uh, your knowledge, uh, possibly with some prototype, which, which does not need to be done under such time pressure. Another uh, point of key value stores have relatively simple APIs. Security can be more complicated. But um, the nice thing about that is if you build a data access layer uh, and abstract it, uh, you should be able to switch out uh, some key value stores with others without impacting the uh, uh, data access layer interface. Unfortunately, the more complicated you get as far as your data structures, uh, the harder it is to divorce yourself from a vendor-specific APIs. 
I'm glad you said the word security because I haven't heard enough about that other than, <laughs> than uh, access control. Uh, there's not a lot of talk about it. And, uh, and uh, do we think that it's automatically secure, that uh, there, are no, there are not going to be any issues uh, discovered? Uh, who, who feels that you know, we have nothing to worry about here? <laughs> you, you didn't go to the uh, Cumulo uh, uh, session on uh, uh, putting security directly in the column store keys then. Oh. So. Yeah. Yeah, so well, I, I missed that. Yeah, yeah. a lot. Of, I think that's a big trend. I certainly saw. Yeah. Uh, I think Mongo had a release that had uh, higher level security. Mark Logic has had it for a while. Uh, we we have an entire chapter in the book on security, just because we think it's an absolutely critical thing, uh, especially as you scale from a pilot into an enterprise uh, grade thing. And the biggest thing is that uh, many organizations won't go, go beyond a single pilot uh, without a good security solution. And I think uh, one of the, key the keynote speakers uh, from Mongo pointed out the fact that this is a critical thing for businesses. It might be a checklist for some people, but for other people in the healthcare and people who need audit trails, it it's a make or break thing. Uh, I think we have at least three solutions that I know of that have fine-grained security uh, in different models uh, today in the NoSQL space. And, um, and I think we're going to start seeing more and more uh, as these systems mature. I think uh, it's the, just a the, the reason that I brought it up is I had kind of realized looking at the, the, the schema list uh, databases uh, that you can do what, something that I just called a, a schema injection uh, because it'll, you know, it'll, it'll accept anything, any field that you pass it. And I wrote a blog post on it. Uh, a Russian podcast picked it up, but other than that, there's been no response, no interest <laughs> whatsoever. And, um, I don't schema know, I injection think it's gonna, attack. It's a, just yeah. in, like yeah. SQL injection, but it's exactly. going to inject a, a gigabyte document. Into right. The well, I, I see it as two ways, right? Where you can you can do a denial of service by just injecting a ton of different fields, uh, or the other thing is you anticipate that uh, the model is going to change, so you stick something in there where where you have something that will break a security layer that might be added on later on. So I think that those are two angles of attack, and and that's something that the application pretty much has to take care of. But we should talk about it, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think that has any time you have public interfaces, that's a good point. All right. So, okay. Yeah. Question there. So last year I was in this place, and one of the staff that was asked is, "What is going to happen for NoSQL in 2013?" Right. So there's talks about, "Hey, we are going to make it more secure. We are going to, you know, have transactional asset and stuff like that." So rolling forward to today, we are still not there. So what? What do you think that we have done between 2012 and 2013 that makes it, you know, that makes NoSQL more powerful now? Well, I, I see a huge leap in maturity at many of the products uh, that we saw on the show floor. I th think the fact that we have security, we have uh, more databases with ACID transactions, uh, we have uh, more products that are highly tuned for uh, flash and solid state drives. Um, I, I think we're starting to see a lot of these vendors mature uh, and a lot more choices. Um, so I, I think the market is actually maturing as, uh, as it should. Any, any I more? see one thing that is really interesting and that is SQL is back. So, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, and we see that in several Did ways. Is it back or bad? Back. <laughs> I say back. I back. Yeah. And, and well, people tend point. to like it, you know, this, this this is uh, now getting really popular. So you can see um, a variety of systems that are uh, coming back with SQL. You could see, for example, Cloud Array Impala. You see the um, like Apache time. Drill. Yep. You see uh, a Dremel from Google. A big SQL from IBM allows you to run the full SQL over your uh, HDFS and HBase loads. On the NoSQL, on the, on the columnar storage, we have uh, Cassandra, which has a really nice SQL3 interface. It resembles more and more to, to full SQL. So I think this is one of the things that will make an actual adoption of these technologies easier. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's a, the addition of additional interfaces for existing data structures has really made the adoption strategies much easier for big companies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Wait. Should, yeah. Okay, this gentleman has the mic, so, so can we yeah. have him we'll on have this question yeah, and then sure. we'll get yeah. Go ahead. So first is the comment on the how to make a popularization of NoSQL. I learned about that by reading a, 
comparison of digital campaign for a uh, presidential election. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, I believe Obama cave, that was the name. That's where I first heard Hadoop, statistical R language. Never heard of SQL, only as a derivative from that. So make a statement like, no sequel helps to be elected into the presidency. <laughs> <laughs> you will have attention of all presidents and all political uh, figures in the industry. And the second question is kind of like a, there's a joke, half joke, half serious, is that happiness comes from lowering expectations. So what expectation we should lower about no sequel uh, to stay happy? Good, good question. Um, so, I think the expectation we tried to lower was SQL, and I think that was the wrong expectation to lower. I think actually acid. <laughs> well, I think the expectation was that we all lowered about the uh, the advent of the NoSQL uh, age, if you like, was that we would remove rich queries from the frameworks. And that's a bad idea. People want to be able to make sense of data. They don't just want to store data or collect it. They want to be able to analyze it and understand its, its significance for their businesses. I think uh, acid semantics, on the other hand, was a great thing to get rid of uh, in some cases. Not all, but in some cases. Um, you know, bearing in mind it's very hard to talk in generalizations about NoSQL as a space because the whole point of different databases for different purposes is that sometimes you care about long-running complex transactions and that's where ACID is great. But for many, for example, we work in real-time analytics space and there where you're collecting a high velocity stream of events and you're doing analytics and then pulling out insight on that data, you do not need transactional semantics because your sensor data or your financial market data or your clickstream data isn't going to change. You're not looking to do updates on it. You're collecting it. It's immutable almost. And you're looking to summarize it and extract trends and forecasts and, uh, and, and count it and, and, and analyze it in a number of different ways. So in those cases, the constraints of traditional uh, relational databases, not the fact that they use SQL, not many things about them except that they insisted on complex uh, transactional semantics or gave you those transactional guarantees, that was, the, that was the challenge. And I think that was the expectation that we lower in order to gain happiness in the real-time analytics arena, at least. And I think that's really important. So if I'm going to represent Team SQL, which I don't, Team Data, that's me, is that this, this undercurrent, first very blatant, now only partially blatant, that we have to trash all things SQL and all things traditional in order to raise you know, what we're doing is really backfiring when you, know, you try to do this outreach because there's a lot of myths being said about SQL. And it's, you know, it starts with the thing I hear at these events all the time is that you know, once you hit 50 gigs on a SQL database, it all falls apart. Well, that's clearly not true. And there are not just some use case, some, uh, case studies on that. There's a bazillion case studies on that. Right. So then you lose credibility because you've asserted a fact that people in the enterprise know for a fact isn't true, is that if we, in the NoSQL world, will just hype on best fit for solving a problem, everyone loves to do that. They want the best fit. And in fact, we went through the whole data warehousing um, coming about that was a way of bashing the relational model because we didn't normalize, we didn't do follow the traditional uh, relational model. We did something different. We aggregate, we separate, we load stuff in. We don't care about the data quality. We fix data quality problems, but we take a lot of crap too in the data house world because the fact that the data is incorrect is also a good thing. So if we continue the sort of bashing of those things, it's going to be really hard to sell the fact that we've got what's a, really a better solution for a specific problem. And I think that's where we need to go for all of those things. So you're just advocating true facts. True facts would be nice. The truthiness all right. of it all. And change confidence to yes sequel. Yes sequel. I guess. Yes, <laughs> yes data. Right. So yes, or, yes, or, yes. our best fit now conference. Right. Yeah, we'll do so that. So there's, there's some uh, hands have been up at the back of the room. I, I want to get to the back of the room yeah, before ahead, I honey. take some of these folks here. And I know that you've got one as well. So. 
So recently I've started hearing about something called NewSQL where they're talking more about the ACID property and now we're also talking about NoSQL also is trying to do that uh, ACID property, right? So where do you see this industry going on, right? Whether it will go more on NoSQL or into NewSQL because they're talking NewSQL is going to be more from the relational database management standpoint of it. Anybody want to grab that? Yeah, so I think NewSQL databases um, offer uh, well, I mean, interestingly, they, 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 off, they offer a lot in terms of um, allowing you to retain many of the great properties of, of the sort of uh, tool chain available to SQL databases, but um, w while offering you some of the properties that you traditionally associate with a NoSQL database, in, in particular scalability. But uh, there is no free lunch. I mean, the reason that NoSQL databases uh, emerged or some of the trade-offs that they made in the early days, if you look at systems like Dynamo and Bigtable, um, were all about making specific trade-offs to allow you to scale out on commodity machines. Now, certain NoSQL databases, uh, certain new SQL databases, almost, uh, you know, they, they, they work round, they bring you back SQL, but at a price. Some of them don't bring you full SQL. They limit the, the scope over which you can do joins or full query semantics. So SQL is not just SQL. There's no such one thing, really. Uh, certain ones require you to run on uh, proprietary expensive hardware platforms with uh, high, uh, high, high performance, low latency interconnects in order to be able to get around the challenge of distributed systems by, uh, by using hardware, which is sort of rather similar to what Oracle Exadata does. Uh, although that doesn't get called new SQL. And I think, you know, you've just got to look carefully. You've got to sort of, um, you've got to sort of push aside the labels, uh, new SQL and no SQL, and look at the specific uh, trade-offs that each individual system makes and evaluate that against your, your need. For example, you know, Cassandra has great support for building clusters across multiple data centers in a single, in a single topology. Um, that's really useful if, you're, um, you're dealing with large data sets and you're dealing with a problem or you're going to be reading or writing from multiple data centers. If you're not, it isn't of significant value to you. If you're dealing with very small data sets in, and you're, you're dealing with documents or with XML objects, then different solutions will be a better fit for you. So pick so your poison sorry. carefully, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. I, would, I would like to add to what Tim is saying. Uh, the common thesis of NoSQL databases is that the traditional relational technology is based on uh, constraints that we had in the mid-80s from, from where these technologies uh, originate. So the thesis now is that uh, we have a different world, the power of CPU is different, we have more memory, and we can uh, design the, the engines of our relational stores in a different way. Now, there are also some other uh, recognitions that, for example, uh, storing data in rows is maybe not the ideal way of storage. Maybe storing data in columns is better. Or maybe depending on your workload, some workloads will benefit from rows, some, some other from columns. So I, I see the um, acceptance and creation of new uh, relational database engines based on these newer principles is what drives the new SQL. And uh, with the change in implementation technology, they are easier to embrace some of the features that we see today in, in uh, NoSQL. So I think what will happen now, um, conventional relational databases will include some elements of new SQL. We see, for example, the DB2 in its later ver latest version includes also columnar storage, so you can choose between rows and columns. So this is some element of, of new SQL in a, in a traditional database. So you see one shift that is going towards NoSQL, and you can see also the NoSQL databases are adopting more and more of the SQL. Um, uh, even though using a completely different uh, implementation aspect. So I think they will get closer, but they will not touch each other. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good point. It's all about tuning the knobs, you know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Back row here. So uh, we all know that Google is the one uh, that came up with the MapReduce paradigm and stuff. Uh, but I also uh, heard recently that uh, Google ditched MapReduce long time back, uh, just when we are all adopting MapReduce and stuff. So is that really true? And if that is true, uh, what is Google headed towards? Like, what are they working on? Any idea? So I think that should only matter if you're Google, or another Google. <laughs> Can someone just Google the answer to that yeah, right yeah. now? I mean, that <laughs> should be available. Um, I think that probably what you're referring to is Google's uh, new uh, global distributed database called Spanner. 
uh, which ironically in German means peeping Tom. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I, I, I think the fundamental thing that I like to think about, uh, about MapReduce is it's really about uh, the parallel uh, transformation of data in independent pipelines. And um, that's a fundamental process that scales uh, over uh, large clusters, whether you're processing images or transforming data. Um, and I don't think that's going to change. I think that the concepts uh, around scalable map and reduce functions, which, which you can do in almost any programming language world, uh, as long as you uh, embrace immutability, right, uh, no side effects, uh, are going to be universal. Um, and I think Google has, is continuing to change their infrastructure to take advantage of better distribution, uh, but I don't think they're going to go away from um, any one um, uh, fundamental uh, change in transformation. I think the way they do it and their software packages that they're using will change all the time. Anything else? Um, um, hi. Yeah, Rick Johnson from NoSQL.org. Um, I have two questions. Well, one question and one joke <laughs> my son came up with. Um, we like jokes. Uh, I'm a little biased, but I'd like to see if I can make this generic question. How can we as a community uh, get people to learn NoSQL a lot better, more than marketing, um, and more than just conferences come like this? How, how can we do that? And I'll follow up with my joke. My, this is for my son, my 14-year-old son. So he said, if Hollywood came here to this conference, uh, it would be the best movie in the world because there would be no sequel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, that's a new one. It's definitely worth it with the search. Sure. Yeah, that, that was a great question, and I think that community is, is very much the answer. Uh, local meetups, and maybe as part of this conference, we can even push doing that a little more. Uh, I run the LA MongoDB meetup in LA uh, along with some, some other colleagues, uh, and I kind of wish that I had maybe done more just straight up NoSQL because. I think sometimes some of the other vendors feel a little uncomfortable presenting, uh, but really, you know, we need the, a wide variety of speakers and also to have training, uh, training sessions, because it's not enough to just do a, a one-hour talk and hear the different vendors. It's really good to sit for maybe three days and, and have some, some trainers, proper trainers do. I know that you're doing some training, uh, as does uh, Vlad, so uh, it'd be great to kind of do a, a tour of, uh, of the cities. Okay, um, so this is some observation leading into a question. One theme we've heard here is change is constant. Today's NoSQL solutions will not be here tomorrow. There will be new ones. Um, so one of the suggestions would be going back to some of the common characteristics, going back to our computer science, what are those, things? like focusing back on that in terms of the education issue, and then the question is, what are those things that we really, you know, maybe are not being taught as well as they should be, or not being appreciated by our, our students that we, we need to do a better job with so that people will be more successful with today's NoSQL technologies and tomorrow's? Yeah, I, I think the one of the ways that I try to approach it is to look for common patterns. Um, one of the things that I have on my bookshelf is the original Gang of Four uh, book on object patterns. Um, and I think those patterns are somewhat universal. They're a little bit more constant than other things. Um, and when we wrote our book, we tried to uh, really focus in on the patterns that we thought were going to be constant. And I think architectural patterns, uh, the concept of key value stores and graph stores and, and uh, um, uh, document stores, are going to be universal patterns. And I think one of the things this year that I see a lot less of is confusion about terminology. I think we are starting to agree on some of these terms. Um, no? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So talking about agreement, yeah. I, think, um, I, I, think, I think actually uh, you know, Andy Gross of uh, Basho did an interesting talk just immediately prior to this one, which was looking at sort of what are the fundamental problems when you are run building distributed systems, what, what happens when you try and make two machines talk to each other? 
Um, and I think he brought up a quote, which I'll horribly misquote now, by Leslie Lamport, which said that distributed systems are when your computer stops working when uh, because of a dependency on some computer you didn't even know existed, which is <laughs> right, which is right. quite a which is quite, quite a nice quip. Um, but but I mean seriously, the uh, you know this has been studied in in the sort of literature for thirty years. It's just quite difficult to sort of expose. Um, it's getting better, but I think uh, organ like conferences like uh, RICON, which is uh, despite the name, not actually about React, just about distributed systems, are fundamental building blocks which will allow you, just like you learn about the nature of programming languages, which will help you move from Java to C++ or to Scala or to whatever, um, are the sort of tools and techniques that I would encourage everybody to sort of get their head around, uh, which is why sometimes you can't have it all, you, you, why cap theorem exists and why you can't just have consistency and availability and partition tolerance all together. And those are useful general purpose tools which are universal truths, unfortunately, which um, which, which will help when, when building these things. And I think that's important. I think what's missing from this community is the fact that we're, we have this current reputation of uh, defining ourselves by what we're not, mm. which is a poor definition, yep. is that we're missing the manifesto, the principles, the splendid truths of why you know, NoSQL isn't just about the flavor of the platform. It's about these whole important goals that we're trying to meet, distributed, high availability, scalability, whatever those things are. We need to be able to agree on what those goals are, define it, and explain it to a way that it doesn't matter what the software is. And that's what we're missing. Exactly. So I would like to add to that. So what is essential for longevity of our, our, our ability to solve problems is that we have proper fundamentals. Now these fundamentals, the way how they are communicated in schools, are often done in a rather dry and theoretical way. And, and when people just hate them and they forget them as, as soon as the exam is over. So uh, what needs to be done is uh, we need to work with fundamentals, but then try them hands-on with some technology. Experience them how they work. And at that level, you will get some basic knowledge and hands-on experience. But that is also not good enough. Uh, then what Dan mentioned, you need to extract patterns. And the patterns are going to be fragments of thought that you will be able to apply to various similar related technologies. And you can think that these patterns are manifestations of these fundamental principles in a way with which we can apply them with technology that we have today, independently from individual products. That's why these patterns are so critical, because when we have a collection of patterns in our mind, we have a language that we can use. And with this language, we can describe, communicate, and solve problems. We're going to have to draw things to a close. Uh, just uh, Adrian Cockcroft's reading list was a pretty good one terms of patents or development. Um, pretty much out of time then. Okay. All right. With that, I would like everybody to give the panel a great hand here. Appreciate everybody coming.